The um, Women's Studies program was uh, really uh, founded after a lot of students um, had expressed an interest in having such a program. So it was student initiated, which I think is a, is a really good, strong point. And in particular, there was a group of, um, an honors group in the English department, and they organized a panel, does U of H need a women's studies program? And since I was known to be a campus feminist at that point, I was asked to speak, and there were several other speakers. And um, our then dean, uh, Jim Pickering, le uh, later became the, the provost and president, and he was very supportive. And so once we had discussed the need for such a program, I think he uh, inaugurated some sort of committee to research how it should be structured and whether it was feasible. And that committee uh, recruited candidates, and there were several candidates, and they selected, you know, I think they made recommendations, and then he appointed me. So I became the founding director. Um, and that, uh, the program was launched in 1991. So one of the challenges that I faced, you asked about challenges, was that um, there, there was an office and it was a completely empty office. <laughs> so there's absolutely nothing. There's no furniture, there's no pencils, pens, rubber bands, <laughs> tables, nothing. So I had to start from scratch and I had a small budget, but it was pretty small and I didn't have any staff. I had one work study student for half time. So it was really, you know, there was a lot of uh, just extra work that went into getting it going. And I had to go over to the, uh, the wh wherever the warehouse is with free furniture for U of H and selected furniture and they brought it in. And so we got things going. And we did have quite a few faculty members teaching courses. So once we did the, when we had done this research as part of that committee of what courses were available and how could the minor be structured. So there, uh, was an, enough of a core group of faculty members that we started a, a faculty board that was, we called it the internal board and the external board. And I had had experience, uh, I, I'm very involved in the arts and I had been on an art board for Houston Center for Photography and I had friends in the art community from Women's Caucus for Arts and so I knew some people through that and a lot of the faculty in the beginning were people from sciences and from the health professions in particular from optometry, Catherine Peake and C Penelope Kegelflom. And they were very involved with AWIS, which is Association for Women in Science. And so um, they recruited people and then we had a woman from the School of Business who was interested in women in business. And so we, we got a, a group of people together and we called it the Community Development Board. And uh, shortly, you know, not long after the group had been founded, our then dean, who was Jim Pipkin, uh, had met Carrie Schuert through the then president, Marguerite Ross Barnett, and put Carrie in touch with me because of her interest in supporting women's issues. And so uh, Carrie got involved with the board pretty early on and, and gave it a lot of direction. So. Um, one of our other challenges was that as a women's studies program beginning in the 90s, you know, we were late to the party. <laughs> a lot of other programs across the country were launched in the 70s, in the early 70s. Um, but that was also an advantage because we had the perspective of what had sort of gone, was good and what had gone wrong in some of these other programs. And I felt that one of the problems was uh, that sometimes the programs were too ivory tower. <laughs> They were too esoteric and they were just involved with kind of abstruse issues of feminist theory. So I really wanted our program to have some sort of roots in the community and outreach to the community and that's why this community board was so important. Uh, another issue was diversity that in the national uh, arena of women's studies at the time there had been a lot of uh, walkouts and complaints about the, the focus being on white women's issues, only on white women. And so we wanted to have a lot of involvement of uh, women from various other groups like African American studies and Mexican American studies. So we did a lot of outreach and got people involved. And so some of our earliest courses did include, you know, Chicana literature with Maria Gonzalez from English and African American women's history with Linda Reed in the history department. And so I felt that we did a pretty good job in that regard. 
we had a good student response, classes, you know, the people signed up for the minor, and ironically enough, our first graduate was a man. <laughs> <laughs> and he did go on to graduate school and did women's studies in his graduate program, too. I think it was English and, and something with women's studies, so that was kind of a, a funny thing. Probably the um, participation of the students and their, their happiness to have this program and their interest and, you know, the courses were really all pretty full and um, we never had an enrollment problem and so, and you know, there was, we, we had faculty talks and we had some brown bag lunches with book discussions and the students were really very responsive and interested. And I also felt that um, we got good involvement with the community through our community board. And um, we planned a conference. We we're, were so ambitious. I think I was naive, you know, maybe all of us were naive, but we wanted to draw attention to the program and we wanted to sort of set ourselves uh, apart as a, as a community oriented program. And so we planned this program on women's health issues and we had it in 1993 so that was only our third year and we had the national the first woman who was the director of the women's health initiative nationally dr vivian penn as our keynote speaker and we had all kinds of uh issues you know topics we had um, women and heart disease and we had um, women and domestic violence and so we had quite an array of different fields represented and it brought a lot of people to campus. I think we had it over at the hotel and so we kind of got a lot of bang for our buck with a lot of publicity and and a good good relationships with different community organizations. So something we learned more about what was out there through 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 having done that. Well, there was um, uh, women in politics was a, was one of the standards. Women in psychology of women, which was always very well enrolled and got a lot of men students. I think they thought they could meet girls, you meet chicks, <laughs> and so those were some of the social science courses. We had sociology of women, and uh, so there, those were pretty standardly off offered. And then I began a course in feminist philosophy, which wasn't until then part of the curriculum, but we got it introduced and made into a standard course in the curriculum. And we had, as I mentioned, the um, several women's literature courses and the, the Chicana women's literature and the uh, women's history and African-American. There was a course, I think it was African-American women in slavery and freedom. It was Dr. Linda Reed's course. So um, we sort of had a good span across the curriculum with uh, humanities and social sciences to begin with. Uh, lectures, I'm not sure I remember very well. Um, I might have to refer to my notes here. We had um, Dr. Florence Ladd, who was the director of the Bunting Institute, which is a, a prestigious women's research institute at Radcliffe. And she spoke on women claiming authority and uh, she was also a consultant for us on the, on the archive, so we might want to come back to her later. And we, um, we had uh, some other speakers, we had some, some of the first of lectures for the Friends group, so one of them was called Writing Women, that was Rosalind Brown and Paula Webb, and one was on healthcare reform with Patricia Stark. So we had, and then we had some of our um, some of our own talks. You know, uh, Susan Rasmussen in anthropology gave a talk on her research on women in uh, Tuareg women in in Africa, and so we had we drew on our own faculty to give talks to. Very interdisciplinary, yes, and you had to have a balance. You had to have some from humanities and some from social sciences. That was the way the minor was set up. And um, we worked and eventually got a introductory course approved that was uh, like a, a core course that all women's studies minors had to take that was just called Introduction to Women's Studies. So that was introduced after several years and got into the curriculum and added to the minor as another requirement.
You know, it's embarrassing. I cannot remember the name of who the current director was. The person I worked with uh, primarily was named Mitzi Voracek. And she was on our board, and I think someone on, who was, you know, one of our local people knew her. And she was the education director for the Houston Area Women's Center. And so that's who got me involved with them. And I did, I, they had me come and consult on feminist ethics, which was a very interesting experience. They had a retreat down in Galveston, and I went down there and talked about just some very basic things about uh, uh, alternative approaches within feminist ethics. And they were, at the time, raising money for their um, new building, which they now have there on WA. And they were having uh, some moral issues about should they um, accept, would they name it after just anybody who donated enough money, or would they have to have some kind of standards <laughs> about who, who, who to name it for? And they were also getting offers of donations from organizations um, that were slightly unsavory, or at least they were questionable to, for, from, from their point of view, like La Bear, the strip club with male strippers. <laughs> and so they, they wanted to talk to me about fe issues in feminist ethics, and so that was one of the things I did. And I also happened to um, know Toby Myers, who was one of the original founders of the Houston Area Women's Center. Um, she's the partner, domestic partner of um, one of my colleagues then, who's now retired. And we did um, uh, some outreach seminars on women, women's issues, feminist issues, and the domestic violence awareness movement. So we did some in Austin, and we did some in, in the Houston area. So those were my main activities. So they had to do with bringing uh, feminist ethics, um, sort of in abstract issues about right and wrong, and how to determine these things in, into relationship with ongoing women's issues, especially domestic violence. That's right, yeah, and, and like who to take money from. And they, they, seemed, they ended up realizing they had a pretty sharp division between the, the people who were in the trenches, um, really working in the shelter, and they just thought you needed so much money, you should take money from anyone. <laughs> and, the, and the people who were more the education uh, side, and they thought that there should be sort of fairly strict standards because you, you needed to uphold a, a particular kind of uh, feminist values. And so that turned out it was helpful to them in that regard that they realized what they were fighting about. <laughs>
And so we, we thought, well, we've got a few really strong collections to start with, and um, this, this might be a, a way to get ourselves <coughs> going. The other problem was um, getting the library to agree because, you know, you go to them and say, well, we want to have an archive and they say, well, you know, that's fine, but where's the space? Who's going to, you know, be the um, processor? Who's going to be the librarians? Who's going to maintain it? What kinds of stuff will you collect? You know, are you going to collect physical materials, material culture things or just papers? So, and we hadn't known anything that we had to define all that and we had to uh, study what the you know the sort of legal rules were on co on uh, people donating collections. So we worked with the head of the library, and fortunately, uh, our timing ended up coinciding with the expansion of the library into the new wing, and they had more room. And then they became you know once we started to articulate what we wanted to collect and what uh, and have a list of what was available and what our focus was going to be. Uh, they became more interested, and we also had to make it part of our challenge to raise money for, at that point, I think we were getting uh, some graduate students to help with the archiving. Because, you know, you need staff. <laughs> you need people to be there. So everything kind of came together in a, in a really good way, and um, we've, we articulated the collection policy in uh, 1994. And then I think the um, the opening, and I have the um, invitation for the opening, In Search of Hidden Treasure, was held in uh, September 24th, 1996. So, you know, we did pretty well moving from having just been founded in 1991 to having this in 1996. But we had so many uh, active people on our board, community people on our board. And we had some nice parties, you know, to increase um, participation and membership. We started this, the friends group as a more general group with these uh, talks that people could attend. And we were fortunate we had a party at Kathy Whitmire's house. And so lots of people came, women in business, women in science, women engineers. We had a big contingent from the Girl Scouts. You know, we got sort of interesting participation that we hadn't quite uh, planned on, but that made it you know, complicated and interesting. And then uh, we, we worked hard to have um, uh, diversity on our board and to reach out to other, you know, women's organizations that we might not have known, you know, might not have known of, like the Top Ladies of Distinction, which was an African-American women's group that had been around for a long, long time. And so, you know, it was, we were all learning as we went along. Partly they'll just learn about the, you know, amazing um, historical resources that are out there in these sort of non-traditional venues. <laughs> you know, that you can look at a, a, a group like a garden club or a social club and you can really infer a lot about, you know, people who want to do any kind of social history or, you know, women's psychology, women's sociology. You can see a lot from what were the topics that they were addressing what were their issues in, in their day, and um, what were the racial dynamics uh, in between some of these different groups. So I think the students can get a kind of uh, an insight into how to do research and what, what materials are out there that are not just, you know, on the web <laughs> or in, in their uh, history textbooks. And so um, I think, you know, that it's, it's the idea that there's these rich, um, rich resources from the past that they they may not have thought to look into and you know there could be things that are just like graphic design you know that are that you can learn about or um, garden design you know there's a whole a whole array of of uh, features that that are uh, prominent within some of these collections that that aren't really just focused on women or women's political issues, but are just about daily life, you know, and the so social issues of different, of the past. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of other things like that where you, you learn about, I don't know, women in sports or something before, before the um, new laws about having equal participation. And, uh, you know, like the Girl Scouts, you know, there's, there's so much involved there, you know, expectation, women's role expectations and how those have changed over time, or women in science, you know, I think that having the living archives as a complement to the 
uh, sort of paper archives was, you know, a brilliant idea. It was not my idea, so I'm not taking credit for it. But to have have um, have these uh, panels that really um, make use of women's uh, voices and record them for posterity um, before they're gone, you know, before people have uh, have died or moved away or you know lost their lost good clear recollections of what their involvement in something was. That's you know, it's great for our undergraduates to hear some of those stories. <laughs> it's, they're very surprised. <laughs> Well, uh, we, as I said, we were fortunate in getting started in the 90s rather than the 70s. Um, and we had the advantage of having, since there'd been 20 years of feminist education and women's studies in various programs in other parts of the country, we could hire across the uh, university new faculty members who took this for granted. And so they came in, and we didn't have to sell them on it. And they, you know, they said, "Well, why isn't there a major? Or why don't you have lesbian gay studies?" You know, so they were coming in with a with a different, uh, you know, the younger people with a different perspective, and that was good. Um, it was not always easy because um, sometimes the community board. Um, didn't really know, you know, the, these would be people who were active in some organization like women in business or women engineers, and they didn't always know much about women's studies per se. And one time we had uh, Betty Friedan for an event, I think uh, this was about 95, and it was a, it was cult, we called it a cultivation event, and she was uh, promoting her book, The uh, Coming of Age. And so, and we had a tea with her at the at the then you know Ritz, and um, she, I I was driving her over there, and she said, "Now what's this tea?" She had a very funny manner. What's this tea? And I said, "Well, we're supporting. We're trying to you know just establish general support and awareness of women's studies." And she says, "Oh, I hate women's studies." <laughs> and I thought, "Oh no, <laughs> this, this is embarrassing. What am I going to do now?" And um, it turned out that it was, and it was for a good reason, because she didn't think women's studies should be sequestered into its own uh, little uh, ghetto. She thought women's issues should be integrated fully with the curriculum all across the board. And that's a view that I think many of us actually share, but we still, it's, we're not there yet. You know, we still, we still need these other courses. And, and many of the courses are, you know, certainly valuable in their own right, like I think feminist philosophy or women's psych psychology of women. But anyway, so the event went fine. She was very charming, and I think it was a good promotion. But there, sometimes we had to do quite a bit of work to talk about um, what is the field of women's studies? What do we do? And so having the women's archive w w gave us something that was a bit more concrete that we could allude to. Well, we're actually valuing women's history, and we're um, making a we're, we're um, providing a place for it to be preserved. And these are, you know, real concrete women. Uh, these are not just some sort of airy-fairy, you know, intellectuals with their abstruse debates. And so I think that was a, that was a really good way to have, have uh, help for us to, to promote women's studies and, and keep it sort of more um, oriented to the, the real world.